an ecology background. I came here because I wanted to learn about evolution and because I wanted to integrate spatial analysis and ecology and thermal physiology, something I've never done before, and evolution and look at species distributions and phenotypic variation across ranges in the Atlantic forest. So the major theme, a major question, overarching question of my dissertation is how past and current climatic conditions and habitat use relate to genetic structure and phenotypic variation across geographic distributions. And why do I have so many damn pictures here? So that's why. So in terms of species responses, I'm going to look at phylogeography, genetic structure. I'm going to look at thermophysiology. I'm going to look at morphology. And I'm going to relate those with environmental change or environmental attributes. I'm going to look at species distribution models and habitat suitability, both current and historical. I'm going to look at microclimate, especially temperature conditions in the microclimates. I'm going to look at something I'm calling macroclimate, or um, what we uh, usually uh, ask, uh, call climate variability. And also, I'm going to look at haptic use or haptic structure. And these are the major players in this game. Uh, Enialis carinatus is a Leosauridae, and Leposomus concoides is a Gymnophthalmidae. These are two species of lizards that are really prevalent in the Atlantic forest, especially in the central Atlantic forest, where my um, research focuses on, and I'm going to uh, give more details about this region and this species in a moment. So here are some very depressing facts about the Atlantic forest, but let's start with the good stuff. So. It's beautiful down there, and um, originally the Atlantic, first of all, this is South America, this is the Atlantic Ocean, this is Brazil over here, you see the state limits there. I want to uh, uh, call your attention to this beautiful place called Bahia up here, <laughs> Minas Gerais is up here, this is Espírito Santo, and this is Rio. And why am I talking about those places? Because they're going to be very important for what we're going to talk later, and my research really focused in that area, the Central Atlantic Forest. Um, so the Atlantic Forest originally um, spanned in this yellow part of the map, and the green and the uh, red are the remnants. That's a very depressing part. So originally we had a 150 million hectare area, and today if you only look at forest patches that are a uh, 100 or larger hectare area, we have only 8% of Atlantic Forest left. And if you, are considering, if you consider smaller fragments of three hectare and larger, we have about 13%. And it's not evenly distributed. As you can see, most of it's down here in, the, in southeastern Brazil. And of course, the first station started since we were colonized by Europeans, and most major cities in, in Brazil are located in the original Atlantic forest extent. And recently, so this map is made every couple of years by this NGO called SOS Mata Atlantica, SOS Atlantic Forest. And this is the uh, 2012 edition with the um, new remnants. And um, in this last two or three years that they recovered this data, most of the deforestation occurs because of coal industry and also because of eucalyptus plantation. And the state winners of most deforestation are Minas Gerais, Bahia, and the Spirit of Santa. And it's especially uh, important because these areas are, you're going to see how important phylogeographically those areas are. And in, um, in terms of municipalities, the only reason why I bring them up is that because this one, a really funny name, Jequitinhonha, I'm going to refer to this as the Jack region, is the second one um, with most deforestation in the last two years. Um, the Atlantic Forest is incredibly heterogeneous. Uh, if you remember the previous slide, it ranges in a very large latitudinal gradient, so you have a lot of different climates. You also have many different vegetation physiognomies. Here, I'm, gonna, I'm showing you uh, a detail of Brazil. This is Bahia, Minas, and Espírito Santo down here. You have different colors. So you have four different forest physiognomies that belong to the Atlantic Forest here. You have what, what's called by WWF, the Bahia Coastal Atlantic Forests, you have the Bahia Interior Forests, you have the Serra do Mar Coastal Forest down in Rio de Janeiro, and then you have the Atlantic Dry Forest. And this is all Atlantic Forest. And um, 
you have uh, climates, you have different uh, physiognomies, and you also have topography that adds um, uh, heterogeneity both in vegetation and climate. Um, it's incredibly rich. We have around 8,000 endemic species of vascular plants, herbs, birds, and mammals in this area. Um, based on uh, a bunch of phylogeographic studies covering the Atlantic forest, we cover at least three very distinct areas. The northern region up here, the central Atlantic forest, and the southern Atlantic forest. And <coughs> this map comes from this paper that looked at distribution and and the mystery in these areas, and they even they went even further and subdivided those those regions, and they found nine distinct areas in the Atlantic Forest. So, all this biodiversity, these very complex patterns of endemicity in phylogeography, and the threat makes the Atlantic Forest one of the biodiversity hotspots. Um, so, a little bit about the species. As I said, these two species, actually, these two genera are really prevalent in the Atlantic Forest. The two species are uh, prevalent in the central Atlantic Forest. They're very different. Um, you cannot see by the picture, but the, uh, the body size is really different. Any alius is very abundant in primary or secondary forest. It really likes a good forest. It's a similar boreal species. There are nine species of any alius in the Atlantic Forest, and only one with the Amazonian distribution. And this family, Leosauridae, is distributed in South and South America, and Enialis is the one, excuse me, um, Enialis is the genus <coughs> with the northernmost distribution. Leposoma belongs to the family Gymnophthalmidae, it's a forest generalist. It seems to be happy anywhere where you have a leaf litter, a humid leaf litter, and some canopy. So, you can find it in primary, secondary forest, the coal plantations. Um, there are seven species, well, six described and one being described by now in the Atlantic forest and 11 species in the Amazon and Central America. And different from any alias and the Leosauridae, the Gymnophthalmidae are basically a tropical family and Leposoma has this southernmost distribution. Um, well, actually, no. Um, <laughs> And why? <laughs> Leposoma is distributed in southern South America. Um, here's the squamate tree of life from uh, Pyron et al. paper. And I just want to point out that these two species are not at all related. Up there in Lacertoida, you have Leposoma, Gymnophthalmida, and down here in Guania, you have Enialis. So I'm really sampling um, almost phylogenetically independent species in the study. So here's a table of contents. <coughs> These are my three chapters. And I'm not going to read those, the, uh, the titles now, because I'm going to repeat them later. But I'm going to talk about two of them. And you're going to see why. They're really rich, and there are many data sets that are integrated in both of them. You're going to be pretty tired by the end. And I <laughs> might have a chance to present this uh, phylogeography, the comparative phylogeography, in a herb group later, maybe. Um, so here we go. The first chapter. I look at how genetic divergence and phenotypic disparity um, correlate um, if they're coupled or decoupled and how the landscape can help us understand why they're coupled or not. And whoa, um, <laughs> I found out about this effect last night. Um, <laughs> um, here I'm going to talk about leposoma skin coitus, and I'm going to look at uh, species distribution modeling phylogeography, thermophysiology, haptitudes, morphology, and microclimate. So uh, it's really, a lot of people are interested in the patterns of divergence and phenotypic disparity because the correspondence between them has the potential to explain mechanisms of diversification and also the buildup of biological diversity. And there are only a handful of mechanisms that drive those patterns in, in, at the end. So you have genetic drift, you have natural selection, you have sexual selection, you have gene flow. There are, you know, that together um, um, influence those patterns. And it's really hard to disentangle the um, 
the role of those uh, mechanisms. But I want to argue that if you use, use the landscape, if you look at those in the context of the landscape, you can really have a better sense of how those components um, are important. Because the landscape integrates both the spatial and also the ecological components that might be important in those patterns. And um, the integration of those questions with the landscape is a somewhat new subfield of landscape genetics um, that uh, Funk and Murphy um, recently um, featured, let's say, <laughs> featured in a paper of molecular ecology where they um, review a bunch of papers that use this um, approach. <coughs> so um, I think we have this kind of null model in our minds that when lineages, when divergence starts to accumulate among lineages, we expect that phenotypic disparity also accumulates. And I'm talking about at the level of interspecific lineages or close related species because, of course, divergence might, might um, accumulate. And, and we know that there are some uh, constraints in phenotypic disparity. The morphous space is not completely uh, filled with species and forms. So, and so we expect a concordance between divergence and disparity. And if we think about in what scenarios you might think you might find those, imagine that each point is a pairwise comparison between two lineages or two populations. So in area A, you have distant related lineages that probably might occupy distinct environmental conditions because they're very divergent genetically and they're very distinct phenotypically. So you might expect that genetic drift and divergent selection might act creating that pattern. Down here in B, you have low divergence and low disparity. And you might find uh, here, this point might be between two lineages that recently diverged, or they're exchanging genes because they're geographically uh, uh, close, for example. And they probably uh, live in very similar environmental conditions. So not enough time passed so drift could accumulate divergence between them, and they might be under uniform selection. But let's be creative. Let's think outside this line. And maybe other areas of this graph are populated with points. So C and D. In, in, what, case, in what scenarios, um, what scenarios can we imagine that create those patterns? For example, in C, you have low divergence and high disparity. And maybe you have those recent, like, recently divergent lineages that are in really different environments. So divergent selection might have acted very quickly, and, and then they show different phenotypes. And in D, you have very distant related lineages that might be under uniform selection. So there is no reason why they are phenotypically distinct. So my goal is to use this approach and look at a group of lizards, uh, liposomes chingoides, and look um, how geographic distance, habitat resistant, resistance, climate stability, affect the patterns of concordance of discordance between divergence and phenotypic disparity in a, in a especially um, explicit context. So here's again that map with the vegetation physiognomies and those little dots are distribution points. That's where Leposomus chingoides is present, that we know. It might be present in other areas that we haven't visited or we don't have reliable information. And Leposomus really likes this, this messy, wet forest with, with um, a canopy and a, a leaf litter. But if you notice, there are two points that are kind of out of place because they're not really on, on the coast or in the green areas. And we're really surprised, it was uh, field work from my dissertation, that we find out about these two very distinct populations of Leposomus chingoides. They are in very distinct habitat types. So up here, I'm going to call this MIG, you're going to see th this again and again. You have that environment up there, you have a heath-like environment. So Leposomus is both in uh, forest and that more open area. Because in, in that area, you have this <coughs> mosaic of open and closed canopy forest. And now here, this is Jack. See why Jack is important? <laughs> one of the winners in the first station. Um, 
you do find liposoma there, both in good forest and that savanna-like, um, almost like restinga, like beach vegetation-like um, habitat. So given that distribution and the habitat types, um, I would expect when I make this graph with liposoma information, I might find the points up there, and those points are probably between <coughs> lineages that are very divergent, but lineages that are divergent and are in different habitat types. For example, when I compare population on the coast and a population <coughs> that are geographically isolated, in MIG or Jack, for example. And down here, I might expect to find points in B and D, and those will be in, in different <coughs> levels of divergence, and those should be comparisons among populations within the stable coastal area. Um, I tested a bunch of hypotheses of drivers of both genetic divergence and phenotypic disparity, and those are classic landscape of population genetics uh, hypotheses. So divergence might be related to geographic distance, a pattern of isolation by distance, or not only distance, but also habitat resistance to movement might also be important for divergence. So I called <coughs> isolation by resistance. Um, divergence might be related to, adapt to local adaptation, for example, to local climates, or to phenotypic disparity. And these are patterns of isolation by adaptation. And lastly, I also tested if climate explains phenotypic variation that I see. Um, a quick <coughs> summary of the methods and data sets. I have a large genetic data set with one mitochondrial locus and six uh, nuclear loci, anonymous nuclear loci. I used phylogenetic methods to first assess phylogeographic structure and also to delimit lineages for phenotypic analysis. Um, the phenotypic data set includes two phenotypes, morphology, uh, body measurements, and also thermal physiology. And I tested the critical temperatures, which are temperatures where the animal doesn't respond anymore, and ecologically, it doesn't write itself anymore. And ecologically, it's uh, the same as lethal temperature, because the animal is, uh, doesn't <coughs> respond to more extreme temperatures, and it's also hopeless uh, in terms of avoiding predation. And I, I did, I used, I measured those and I compare among populations with, uh, first I reduced dimensionality of the morphological data set with discriminant function analysis and BCA, and I also compare that using ANOVA. And finally, the environmental data set, I have the distribution points, I have biofilm variables extracted from those points. Um, in current and past conditions, and I did uh, species distribution modeling and projected the modeling in, uh, in a pa three past periods. You're going to see the maps. And I also reduced the variability in macroclimate, the world point data set, using uh, principal components analysis. <coughs> and those hypotheses, those landscape uh, genetics hypotheses, I tested with a Montel test approach and with simple correlation tests. Um, here are again the population genetic hypothesis just in terms of the matrices because these are distances among populations. You have the variable, the response variable, which is always divergence. You have the possible explanatory variables. You have a covariate. I, when I'm not testing for geographic distance, I correct for geographic distance. Those are the hypotheses again. Um, and the, the way I calculated those matrices were Divergence, I use uh, a species tree and use the branch lengths to calculate distance among the lineages. Uh, geographic distance is pretty much self-explanatory. <coughs> I use the maps uh, of Maxent to calculate a historical uh, connectivity in the landscape and use that as a resistance surface to calculate the resistance of the, the habitats. I use the Maholanobis distance between locations well, using the 19 bioplane variables to calculate this matrix. And I also use Mahalanobis distance for, with the morphological measurements. Jumping to the results, this is a liposoma a species tree, and I actually have more than liposoma skin coitus here. I have actually all the species of liposoma in the Atlantic forest represented. And also, I have a lot of this is more like a phylogeography of liposomal skin coitus. So the tips are named by the localities or the, um, the populations. And the branches are really, 
the nodes are really well supported, and you see deep phylogeographic structure within liposomal skin coitus. And some, this divide between two groups is even deeper than the divide between the other two species of liposoma. And here are the lineages I collected phenotypic data for. And as you can see here, so normally you have one locality being one lineage. The only exception is here, where you have a bunch of geographically close localities being one lineage. And uh, here, due to small sample sizes, I collapsed this and used this as one lineage. And it, I'm going to use this color scheme in the rest of the presentation of the uh, results. This is uh, a canonical axis. I have canonical axis one and two from the discriminant function analysis represented here. And I color coded the lineages. And first of all, this axis here, I kind of exaggerated what it represents. It represents an axis of, on this side, you have elonga body elongation and limb reduction. And this is a really common theme in Gymnophthalmidae. You find that among species and also within species. Um, and this axis here, which is 34%, uh, includes trunk lengths, foot lengths, and body size and head lengths in a slightly complicated way. But what's important here is that you have the two geographically isolated populations having similar convergent morphology. That is different from the other populations in on the coast. And this group here um, is also a group on the coast, and they are in the southern periphery of the distribution. Um, I'm just going to remind you again that in those two areas, the liposomal skin coitus is both in forests and more open habitats. So it's, the morphology is con it's convergent, and they both use uh, uh, more open areas. Um, this is the species distribution modeling for liposoma. The current distribution, the mid Holocene, last glacial maximum, and uh, the last interglacial. And this, I see this as the potential distribution of liposoma, and it might have responded to quaternary um, climatic oscillations. As you can see, the maps uh, here are different. And the colors, I, I ran each model 25 times and then stack the maps so the uh, red represent pixels that are suitable in all those maps. And orange, yellow in 70% of those maps. And then the blue in none of those maps. So we have an idea. That, so being very conservative, I'm really looking at the red ones where I have more confidence that they have been suitable and uh, stable. Um, precipitation explains more of or limits more liposomal skin coitus distribution than any temperature variable. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, the stability map when I stack all those maps together. And here is the tree again. So you, <coughs> I want you to look at the location of those lineages and the stability, <coughs> the suitability of habitat. So the geographic isolates, Miguel Calmo and Jack, they persisted um, in unstable or heterogeneous areas. So I'm, I'm zooming in here and there, so you see that some pixels were suitable, some were not suitable. So I'm not really sure about what the habitat was like there. But then we have different a habitat shift, and then a heterogeneous or unstable habitat. There's concordant with a different morphology. And that's exactly what I'm showing here. Um, and this is the PCA with the 19 biopling variables. Um, and the distribution points of liposoma plus 7,000 random points in the central, central clinic forest. So you have an idea of the background uh, environmental gradient and where the, lo the populations, liposomal populations, are located in this environmental space. Uh, you can see that liposoma um, populates a lot of the environmental gradient that you see in macroclimate in the northern Atlantic forest. And also that those weird looking uh, populations, they are in the most seasonal uh, part of the gradient. I'm, I haven't explained that, but it's done here. In that direction, you have an increase in precipitation, also in temperature <coughs> seasonality, because the dry season is drier. 
And in this axis here, you have another axis of temperature seasonality. Um, I tested uh, for a uh, correlation between uh, principal component one of morphology and the canonical axis, sorry, principal component of, of um, climate and the canonical axis of morphology. And I see a correlation. So the morphology is correlated with climate. These are the physio uh, physiology results. I had three populations of liposomal skin coitus and was lucky or unlucky, I don't know, to get two <laughs> syntopic different species of liposoma in one place. I, and I didn't know, I tested that, I thought it was testing, you know, five populations of skin coitus until someone ca caught them the fingers and said, oh, this guy has four instead of five fingers. Haven't you seen this? Okay. <laughs> um, anyways, it's an interesting comparison because here I have three populations of liposomal skin coitus and the physiology doesn't change. And when I compare with the other two species, there is this species here has a lower sitting mean than um, at least this population here in Leposomus coitus. I'm, I'm going to go into details in the uh, interspecific variation in physiology, but I, I found it. And it's interesting that you don't see any variation in physiology in Leposoma, despite the fact that those populations are spread across in this environmental gradient. Um, regarding the uh, hypothesis, I, I saw a signal of isolation by distance, and I saw a correlation between morphology and climate, but nothing else. And these are corrected from multiple comparisons. Um, finally, the graph we're all waiting for, where I have um, phenotypic disparity in relative <coughs> divergence time, and here I have only morphology because I didn't see any variation in physiology in this group. So first, the, the stars are pairs that include <coughs> one population in the stable and coastal area and one geographic isolated population. Um, and they're all up here or here. Now, this point includes the two um, geographic isolated populations that have very similar morphology. That's why the disparity is very low. And the open circles include comparisons between populations that are both in the stable area. Um, these two pairs are populations that are really close geographically. And when I put those, when I um, delimit those areas again, we talked about in the beginning, what I find is that, right, in A, I see comparisons between look, uh, populations in the stable area and the isolates. And down here, I see mostly comparisons among populations in the stable area, except for this and except for a couple of points. It's not perfect. Uh, and here, I also have very distinct, um, morphologically distinct lineages that have um, moderate divergence time. Um, and to put that in a broader context, I did the same, but now I included those uh, field circle points. These are interspecific comparisons. So I have different species of liposoma being compared here. And what's interesting, oh, I didn't uh, point out something important before, is that there is no correlation here. You can see the, there's the test for correlation. There is no correlation between divergence and disparity within liposomal skin coitus. But there is among liposomal species because there is a correlation here. And what happens is the, um, the geographic isolate populations that are weird morphologically and live in a different habitat, they do disrupt the concordance we expected to find between uh, uh, phenotypic disparity and genetic divergence. Um, one weird point in the <coughs> interspecific comparisons that between liposoma nectans and the new species being described now, they really have shallow divergence time and they're really similar morphologically. And actually, that's why it's been so hard to describe the species. We look at it and say, oh, it's different, but we don't really know how to describe the species yet. Um, and, at, and as a summary, we see that isolation by distance and long-term persistence explains the different geographic structure within this low vigility species, especially because those populations are in this stable area. But it opens up the question, what? created the isolation in the first place. Because if they've been there in this beautiful, uh, suitable habitat, why didn't they just exchange genes like crazy? 
We don't know that. And probably the isolation mechanisms are not related to habitat type um, or morphology, because we don't see differences in morphology. <coughs> we do see uh, isolation in, because of geography, and that's also concordant with habitat shift. But it's hard to, to um, decouple the role of uh, geography and habitat shift in this case. Um, and we, we think that also chemical reception, chemical communication might be important in this group because if you look at all the species of liposoma, they all look the same, they're all small and brown. So there, there has to be a way that they recognize each other. And we're going to follow up on this in my postdoc work. We're starting to do chemical profiles of different populations of liposoma. Um, precipitation limits, limits a liposoma's uh, distribution more than temperature. And so it's concordant with the lack of variation in thermal physiology. Uh, climate explains morphological variation, and this is concordant with local adaptation of plasticity in body size. <coughs> and body elongation is related to drier climates, and this is concordant with a, a, a pattern for this family. Uh, morphological disparate lineages inhabit more seasonal areas, and there is this morphological concordance. So we think that habitat shifts are driving morphological uh, differentiation here. Um, uh, behavioral thermoregulation, we hypothesize that behavioral thermoregulation and niche tracking might buffer differences in climate across the distribution and then and that this creates a shift in morphology. The shift in morphology um, allows liposoma, different population of liposoma to explore those clim climatically suitable but differently uh, structured microhabitats in the open areas. And finally, um, geographic isolation, shifts in habitat use, and climatic stability can explain the decoupling <coughs> of divergence and disparity within this group. Um, hopefully I convinced you of this. Um, okay, second part. This is shorter, I <laughs> promise. Um, so next thing I wanted to look at was uh, thermophysiology. And if this is a possible mechanism that explains distributions and also uh, geographic, um, phylogeographic patterns. So here it is, evolution of thermal sensitivity and thermal opportunity in the tropics, geographic variation, acclimation, and microclimates. And now I'm going to talk about both species. Of course, I'm going to talk about thermophysiology in the context of phylogeography, and I'm going to look at microclimates, microclimates, and habitat use. Um, so for ectotherms, Temperature is really, really important for the biology and natural. They don't function if they don't achieve a certain temperature. And that doesn't depend on diet or metabolism. It depends on environmental temperatures. So the sun has to come out at some point, otherwise. <laughs> um, so there are many, uh, um, recently, there's been a lot of uh, concern about how vulnerable those uh, organisms are then to future climate warming. Um, and all those ideas actually stem from a classic paper published in 1967 by Daniel Jansen, uh, where he says mountains are higher in the tropics than in the temperate zone. And all this comes from a very clever observation about variation in climate in, in an altitude and elevation of gradient in both temperate and tropical areas. So um, if you look at this, um, this graph now, this is, um, these are the month the year, this is temperature, this is a tropical place, the upper line is a, let me use the low tech pointer, <laughs> this is a low altitude side, this is a high altitude side, what you see is a, a little variation in temperature over the year and no overlap between those sides. And Jensen said, so this should um, select for populations that are locally adapted to those narrow in non-overlapping conditions. Differently, in the temperate zone, a low altitude and high altitude sites have a lot of temperature variation over the year, and there is a lot of overlap. So these populations here, they, much ha they should have much broader temp uh, thermal um, limits, and they actually are okay. Populations from low altitude are okay to move to high altitudes, because in those places, they're at some point in the year, they're going to experience the same conditions they experience in their native site. Um, and indeed, there are 
over this 50 years, a lot of people have tested those ideas <coughs> and those predictions. And this is one example when um, uh, Deutsch et al., it's a PNAS paper, they look at multiple insect populations and they um, tested the critical temperatures and the optimum temperatures of those populations and also measured the environmental temperatures experienced in uh, tropical and, and temperate species or populations. And what you see is that the critical temperatures are much closer to the environmental um, to the environmental temperatures in a tropical area than in the temperate zone. But thermophysiology and then the rela relationship with environmental conditions is a little bit more complicated than that because behavioral thermoregulation and the availability of microhabitats that are different from the macroclimates, they might change the game. So for example, this is a, a microcurrent in uh, Porter's paper, 2009, they let, uh, they measured body temperature for lizard that was sitting in full sun, and this is the histogram of body temperatures. Um, the same lizard was sitting in 90% shade, and the same lizard was allowed to thermoregulate. So you see a drastic difference in the body temperatures experienced by the same lizard in those different conditions, and most importantly, this gray bar here represent the optimal temperatures. So the optimal temperatures they match almost precisely the uh, most common body temperatures when the lizard was thermoregulated. regulating. So this really changes uh, the environment that the organism experiences. And uh, finally, very recently, a, a large model selection exercise with a huge data set with lizards from across the globe found that preferred body temperature, precipitation explains more preferred body temperature than any temperature variable tested. And that temperature variation, not temperature means, are the best climatic, um, um, explains more of critical thermal maximum than the other variables tested. And only critical thermal minimum was explained more by uh, mean, mean temperatures. And this is surprising <coughs> because often when you talk about climate change or thermal physiology, people test their thermophysiology always against uh, means, um, temperature means. So these are the three major questions I answered with this study. First, how macro and how microclimates vary across a tropical um, climatic gradient. Is there interpopulation variation in thermal sensitivity? Is there acclimation capacity? And also, what are the climatic drivers of thermal physiology? The predictions is that because they are um, tropical lowland ectotherms, that their thermal limits and preferences should correlate with environmental conditions. They should have, when I look at populations within the species, the ones in more seasonal areas should have broader thermal limits, and there, there must be limited acclimation capacity. In terms of climate, I might, I might expect that low altitudes and high altitude sites might not have a lot of overlap, and that means and extreme temperatures might correlate positively negatively with altitude. Um, here are again the stability maps for the two species with the populations I got physiology data for. This is altitude. Um, and this is the tree. And I here label the lineages I uh, sampled. It's pretty well sampled. The Lepo, uh, Cat Inialis catenatus is pretty well sampled. Leposomus concoid is not so much. But I covered, I think, quite a bit of um, environmental gradient and um, latitudinal variation here. Very briefly, uh, in terms of environmental data, I got word clean data. <coughs> I also deployed I buttons in all those areas and I collected data in those microhabitats over a year. And I experimentally tested the critical thermal temperatures. And also I let the lizard run around in a thermal gradient while I was measuring body temperature to look at preferred temperatures. I did that with all individuals right after capture and then after two acclimation, um, acclimation periods. One to the average conditions they found in their native site and also to extreme conditions. <coughs> in terms of uh, analysis, it's this very, um, it's a summary. I look at climatic variation across the geographic range. 
I looked at the thermophysiology among populations and between species. And I compared thermophysiology with climatic uh, conditions. So we have seen this before. This is again um, a PCA with uh, 7,000 points of the northern central Atlantic forest. Here are all the populations that are sampled for both species. Actually, these, um, these are um, any alias with a, an arrow. And in terms of macroclimate, you have here mean annual temperature, maximum temperature in the warmest month, temperature seasonality, minimum temperature in coldest month. All of them are correlated with elevation. This is elevation here, and these are the temperatures. And uh, these are the different populations where I got um, data for, where I got the animals for, and I just highlighted this area, which is the open area in Jack. And you can see that um, the open area, actually here it's more evident, the open area is really different from the forest areas. This is microclimate now. This is the I button data. And what you see is that there is a correlation with altitude and annual temperature, but there it's much uh, weaker with maximum temperature and almost nothing with seasonality. <coughs> so when I compare macroclimate and microclimate, and it's really hard to just say those words differently, um, mm -hmm. I don't see, so macroclimate is not really a good proxy for microclimates. Because although here it was to have a, a significant with a good effect size relationship, um, word claim kind of um, assigned those areas higher temperatures, higher mean temperatures. Over here it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. This is not so great. And this is a good relationship, but again, most of the areas, the temperature, the macroclimate says that the minimum temperature in those areas is higher than I actually measured in the microclimates. Um, here is the physiology data um, in the temperatures in the microhabitats. In yellow, you have um, on top of the leaf litter. In gray, you have under the leaf litter. This is Citimax, Citimin, and this is uh, the range of voluntary body temperatures bounded by the 25th and 50th, um, 75th percentiles for liposomal skin coitus. Um, so Citimax is really far from most of the environmental temperatures except the jack, and these are temperatures uh, in the open areas. And what's curious here is that the preferred temperatures overlap with the extreme temperatures in most places. Um, and, um, so over here, the optimum temperatures are really hard to find during the winter for liposoma. And it, they're only available in the more open areas. Um, this is Citimax and Citimin, um, comparison among populations. Um, after capture, after the first, after acclimation to average temperatures, after acclimation to extreme temperatures, and bottom line here is that there's no variation among populations, either after capture or either uh, any of those treatments. So this is thermal tolerance, Citimax minus Citimin, and these are the preferred temperatures. So it's really conserved. Thermophysiology in liposoma is really conserved. It's a different story for Enialis catenatus. I got more populations of Enialis. Unfortunately, I didn't have um, um, microhabitat data spanning through a whole year in all localities. But what you see here is that uh, Citimax is also very far away from the environmental temperature, so this, end, this population seems to be safe. It's not the same with citamine. Citamine, the environmental temperatures reach citamine during the winter. But citamine doesn't kill a lizard. Citimax can kill really easily. So those two are very different um, things. And here, the preferred temperatures, they're more like um, the average temperatures in those, in those natal sites, Ex uh, except for this high altitude place where, again, the preferred temperatures overlap with the extreme temperatures during the summer. So those populations in both species might be operating suboptimal temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, there are, I, 
I found very, um, differences among populations in all, um, in all traits I measured after capture, but those differences mostly disappeared after acclimation. So interpopulation variation in the islands is just plasticity, which is kind of surprising because we don't expect plasticity in the tropic of species. Um, here, thermal tolerance, again, um, I had differences after capture, but most of them disappeared, except in this case where I found a different, um, which, which doesn't um, recover the same difference here. And what's really remarkable is that I just plotted the average temperature during acclimation on top of the preferred temperatures. And those animals, they track really well the average environmental conditions with their preferred temperatures. That's, that was really surprising. This is one of the few cases in squamates where I have such a close match. And why are they matching, tracking the environmental temperatures so closely? I don't know, especially because if you remember the microhabitat data, it doesn't change so much in between sites. Um, and finally, I compared the two uh, species, and the difference I found is that Leposomus quincoides, the forest generalist, has a higher C2 max than any Alus catenatus, which is reasonable, expected. Um, in terms of the climatic drivers of the thermal traits, um, I found a correlation between climate and the thermal traits only when I look at data in the microhabitat scale. And this is, there is a big caveat with this analysis that I ran multiple ANOVAs and ANCOVAs, so when I correct for multiple comparisons, none of those are significant. But if there is a correlation between climate and thermophysiology, it's only at the microclimate scale. So word clean doesn't say much, really, about uh, physiology in, for these two species. So concluding, um, macro, macro climate data, word climate data, is not so great um, to represent the temperatures that those lizards really experience in the microhabitats. And this might be a pretty uh, broad pattern for tropical, um, tropical climates because Carlos Navas recently published a paper looking at body temperatures and air temperature in, in uh, Great and in the Andes. And the microhabitat data correlates well with body temperature, but not word clean data. Um, there is a great overlap in temperature availability in the similar microhabitats along altitudinal gradient. So uh, the microhabitats really buffer macroclimatic differences. Um, climate correlates with tomo traits, but only in the microclimatic scales. And climate affects more any other scatenatus than liposomes can call this thermophysiology. Uh, thermal sensitivity is conserved in liposomes quincoides, which is expected for tropical species, but we have plasticity and acclimation in that Enialus catenatus. And this might have to do with the fact that Leosauridae is more of a temperate uh, taxon, whereas Gymnophthalmidae is a clearly tropical clade. So niche, um, niche conservative might be more important in the tropical clade than in the more, more, uh, more temperate clade. Uh, differences in thermophysiology between these two species can explain some of the ecological differences, but they cannot explain their ge phylogeographic structures because Jensen predicted that those temperate populations, because they can uh, walk along the altitudinal gradient because the climate is fine, they experience the climate at some point during the year, there might not be a lot of uh, phylogeographic structure. In, in the tropical species in an altitudinal gradient, you might see um, a lot of phylogeographic structure. But here what I found is a lot of overlap in this, in climatic uh, conditions along this gradient, but also a lot of phylogeographic structure. So they are decoupled. Um, and in this system, uh, thermophysiology doesn't seem to be a mechanism that can promote po population differentiation and the speciation, something that Jensen proposed that could be the case. Um, that's it. Uh, hopefully I, whoa, hopefully <laughs> I, um, hopefully I showed you how passing current climate conditions and habitat use can uh, uh, 
explain genetic structure and phenotypic variation using those two species as models. Um, and I have to thank so many people, and I needed a pile of money to do all this. <laughs> really, thank you. I won't read this. And yes, I can see you in Sao Paulo. I'll, I'll move there um, in a couple of months, and also Evolution is going to be there in two years. So give me a call. Thank you. <laughs> Don't mirror microclimate. And microclimate is what drives the distribution and other aspects of these species. Then doesn't that give you kind of pause to do the ecological niche modeling based on the macroclimatic data to define areas of stability? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so is there a way then to get from the macroclimate to the microclimate to redo those analyses? Yeah. Not just for this species, but you're making the argument that that pattern should reflect across the board for tropical species. Yes, you could if you, that was one idea we had to deploy our buttons everywhere, get other variables, vegetation, um, the structure, all the covariates, and then make a model. So when you get the word plane, you can just run through this model and then get the climate all the other way. But a better way to do it, and it's especially hard, would be use those mechanistic distribution models, where you do use the microclimate data, you use some information about the biology of the lizard or whatever, I mean, the size, the shape, the microhabitat, and then you model the distribution. But those are the mechanisms, not the I mean, The corollary to that question is then, can you redo? on a carnival and Craig's, you know, <laughs> Pleistocene refugial, you know, analyses uh, and ignore the, the macroclimate data if it's the microclimate that really mm -hmm. drives things. And if one did that, would one come to a different conclusion? Good question. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. And we have evidence to move on and try to get a more maybe realistic model of distribution. I guess this raises the more general issue. I mean, people are using those world climate, the macroclimatic yeah. data all over the place to, to, to do exactly. things. And we're using it. And, uh, but the climatic um, range that you're looking at is, is I guess, somewhat narrow compared to you know what, what exists. Do you, have you thought more generally about the extent to which this is a problem? And, and uh, I mean, should, should people be going out and for their species trying to measure micro yes. climatic data in, in general? Do you think when you go over bigger geographic scales it becomes less of an issue? So I also showed that macroclimate is always correlated with microclimate, yeah. right? So they're not completely disconnected. But more for some traits than yeah. others, like the annual yeah. means. Yeah, or vari yeah. variations and extremes. That's where they're, they're more disconnected. I, I, I don't have a good sense of, you know, a broader um, geographic scale, how different it is. Well, one thing I saw here is that the maximum temperatures are really different. Word claim says, oh, the maximum temperature here is 37 when my I button registered 42 at some point. That the extreme is much higher. It gets, the a macro, word claim gets the lower temperature as well. But, but the maximum temperature is not so well. And that reflects on seasonality. Is it possible? World climate number is over a, a decade old now, right? Mm -hmm. it's, two th it's only 95 to 2001, so it's, it's just a snapshot in that period. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is it po potentially, you know, are there other weather stations, you know, we, indicators in that area that might... We're going to try to dig the information from Brazilian weather stations. Mm -hmm. And, and make our own climate layer or try to model the microclimates and the macroclimates. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. But also, um, it's so hard when I remember all the high buttons and <laughs> I am not very, um, you know, like, oh yeah, we're going to do this in five years, it's going to be fine. I, it's hard. Yeah. And, uh, I actually have a few questions about the I buttons because mm -hmm. I remember when you. Uh, First embarked on that uh, 
so about the deployment, I mean, mm -hmm. was there a lot of, do, do you think some of the differences that you saw between the two species might be related to one being semi-arboreal, one being leaf litter, and did you employ the eye buttons and corresponding sort of... Yeah, I didn't areas. mention that, but I, so I found a tree, you know, the place of two trees because I wanted replicates, and then one micro half that was a meter and a half high on the tree, because that's the highest I can reach. Semi arboreal micro half that. One is here on top of the leaf litter. Okay. The other one is down here, five centimeters below oh, the leaf litter. Okay. So Leposome skin cutis is here, okay. below and on the leaf litter. Uh, any alios is up here and on top of the leaf litter. Okay. And I use these two uh, data sets to compare with the thermal physiology. Oh, okay. So I tried to match the microhabitats. And there was variation. I didn't have time to go uh, uh, to details. But of course, temperature right here varies a lot more than here, like a meter and a half right, yeah. mm -hmm. up in a tree, in the same tree. Um, so it does change. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I and if so, or if not, um, how is going to affect? Do you think it's going to affect your conclusion when you're talking about drifting selection? Sorry, you asked about population size? Yeah, in the past. We don't. We don't have a good estimate of population size. We're going to use coalescent methods to try to estimate population size and coalescent time. That's what we plan to do. Um, but we don't have good historical records, so we can um, model potential changes in distribution of population size with future climate change. So Barry Sinervold published a paper a couple years ago where he proposed uh, a model for that. And he used some data on, on this species, or at least some liposome species. But we don't have good data for that. We cannot do a Grinnell project down there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? In the first part of the talk, it looks it looked like there was a, um, a, a big break between the northern Atlantic forest and southern Atlantic forest. Yes. And with a, a deep split that you, I mean, you commented actually was older than the split between some other species. The, two questions. One is, what is the age of that that divergence, and does it correspond with known vicariance events that in, or similar patterns seen in other taxa? Don't know yet. That's the next step for those, uh, for this uh, next set of analysis. We're going to try to date. Let me just clarify something. When I said there is a dip, there, the, this is split is between the northern and southern Leposoma skin coitus group. Right, that's the, the one I'm. Yeah. yeah, but this group is all in the central Atlantic forest. Yeah. It's not central but and when northern. you showed the map, it looked like the clay, the, 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 those correspond to a northern and, and more northern and you know, and less northern clay. They were both kind of north. But. <laughs> that's right. That's precise. But yes, exactly. Here. So yeah. they're, they're both here. And the, here is the divide, the geographic divide. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's the age of that split? And Don't know yet. What's Sorry. the mitochondrial divergence, for example? The, oh, it's 10%. So it's old. It's it's very old. It's very old. Yes, if you yeah if you think it's allopatric, if you think of molecular clock, it's what one percent half to one percent million year. It's very very old. It's, Much it's older than certainly the older than uh, the twenty one k. Yes, it's it's older than any of the ages yeah. you were you were showing there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so do, do you see that same division in other taxa? Yes, yeah. I do. Okay. But I also think that those. Uh, later quaternary climatic oscillations might be important in uh, maintaining the deep phylogeographic structure that was established way back. Okay, so, but they're not explaining that, that division. No, 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 they're not because yeah. those splits are much, much older than yeah. that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I'm thinking of your clauses are here today, Roberta, but I wonder if you care to explain your inventions talk about Lionel Richie. Oh no no! I want to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just I wonder if you care to comment on that. That was one of the highlights of your dissertation. Oh yeah, so we realized that my haircut is really similar to all Lana Richie's <laughs> video clips. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's let's just advertise. <laughs> there you go. 
I'm, I'm roasting a little bit. There's a vinyl where she posted in various places and it's taken off. But have you seen the videos? That's fine. That's yeah. why I would like it. <laughs> That's right. There's, there was no music to the, your presentation. Oh, we yeah. had You have high, you know, bars to Where's reach the here. Pictures? After the Tom Devitt, you know, Barry White <laughs> talk. Barry White? Yeah. Well, how come there wasn't well, any rich? You know, if you come to the to 3172, we do have musical moments in the office. Musical moments. Every day we watch a video clip and look, look is my witness here. Yeah. <laughs> we do we have great musical and dancing moments in 3172. Uh, 30, so, so yeah, I obviously put them to the science. <laughs> 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 are, are there other questions for Roberta? I'm here next door for three more weeks. So. I, I meant to say at the beginning I, I was going to invite uh, uh, anybody to introduce new people and I was going to introduce some of the new people from my lab but some have already left so I, my apologies, we'll do that next week. I, I want to make sure anybody who's new meets everybody else. So. Uh, sorry Taichi and others. We'll, we'll get to you next week. <laughs> Thank you Roberta. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And so is there a way then to get from the macroclimate to the microclimate to redo those analyses? You Not could. just for this species, but you're making the argument that that pattern should reflect across the board for tropical species. Yes, you could if you... That was one idea we had, to deploy our buttons everywhere, get other variables, vegetation, um, structure all the covariates and then make a model so when you get the word claim you can just run through this model and then to get the microclimate all the other way. A better way to do it, and it's especially hard, would be use those mechanistic distribution models where you do use the microclimate data, you use some information about the biology of the lizard or whatever, I mean, the size, the shape, the microhabitat, and then you model the distribution. But those are the mechanisms, not the I mean, The corollary to that question is then, can you redo on a carnival and Craig's, you know, <laughs> Pleistocene refugial, you know, analyses uh, and ignore the, the macroclimate data if it's the microclimate that really mm -hmm. drives things? And if one did that, would one come to a different conclusion? Good question. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. And we have evidence to move on and try to get a more maybe realistic model of distributions. I guess this raises the more general issue. I mean, people are using those world climate, the macroclimatic data all over the place to, to, to do things. Exactly. I mean, we're using it. And, uh, but the climatic um, range that you're looking at is, is I guess, Somewhat narrow compared to you know what Absolutely. what exists. Do you, have you thought more generally about the extent to which this is a problem? And, and uh, I mean, should should people be going out and for their species trying to measure micro yes. climatic <laughs> data in, in general? Do you think when you go over bigger geographic scales, it becomes less of an issue? So I also show that macroclimate is always correlated with microclimate, yeah. right? So they're not completely disconnected. But more for some traits than yeah. others, like yeah. annual me yeah. means. Yeah, or vari yeah. variations and extremes. Yeah. That's where they're, they're more disconnected. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a good sense of, you know, a broader um, geographic scale, how different it is. Well, one thing I saw here is that the maximum temperatures are really different. Word claim says, oh, the maximum temperature here is 37 when my I button registered 42 at some point. That the extreme is much higher. It get the macro word claim gets the lower temperatures well. But but the maximum temperature is not so well. And that reflects on seasonality. Is it possible? World climate remember is over a, a decade old now, right? Mm -hmm. it's, two th it's only 95 to 2001, so it's, it's just a snapshot in that period. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is it po potentially, you know, are there other weather stations, you know, we, indicators in, in that area that might... We're going to try to dig the information from Brazilian weather stations. Mm -hmm. And, and make our own climate layer or try to model the microclimates and the macroclimates. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. But also, um, it's so hard when I remember all the high buttons and <laughs> I am not very, um, you know, like, oh yeah, we're going to do this in five years, it's going to be fine. I, it's hard. Yeah.
I actually have a few questions about the I buttons because mm -hmm. I remember when you uh, first embarked on that. Uh, <laughs> so about the deployment, I mean, mm -hmm. was there a lot of, do, do you think some of the differences that you saw between the two species might be related to one being semi-arboreal, one being leaf litter, and did you employ the I buttons in corresponding sort of? Yeah, I didn't areas. mention that, but I, so I found a tree, you know, the place of two trees because I wanted replicates. And then one micro hat that was a meter and a half high on the tree, because that's the highest I can reach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the the semi arboreal yeah, okay. micro hat. One is here on top of the leaf litter. Okay. The other one is down here, five centimeters below oh, the leaf litter. Okay. Okay. So Leposomus skin cutis is here, okay. below and on the leaf litter. Uh, Any alios is up here and on top of the leaf litter. Okay. And I use these two uh, data sets to compare with the thermal physiology. Oh, okay. So I tried to match the microhabitats. And there was variation. I didn't have time to go uh, in, uh, to details. But of course, temperature right here varies a lot more than here, like a meter and a half right, yeah. mm -hmm. up in a tree, in the same tree. Um, so it does change. Anyone else? Yes? And if so, or if not, um, how is going to affect, do you think it's going to affect your conversation when you're talking about drifting selection? Sorry, you asked about population size? Yeah, in the past. We don't. We don't have good estimate of population size. We're going to use coalescent methods to try to estimate population size and coalescent time. That's what we plan to do. Um, but we don't have good historical records, so we can um, model potential changes in distribution of population size with future climate change. Well, Barry Sinerval published a paper a couple years ago where he proposed uh, a model for that. And he used some data on, on this species, or at least some liposomal species. But we don't have good data for that. We cannot do a Grinnell project down there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? In the first part of the talk, it, looks, it looked like there was a, um, a, a big break between the northern Atlantic forest and southern Atlantic forest. Yes. And with a, a deep split that you, I mean, you commented actually was older than the split between some other species. The, two questions. One is, what is the age of that, that divergence? And does it correspond with known vicariance events that in, are similar patterns seen in other taxa? Don't know yet. That's the next step for those, uh, for this uh, next set of analysis. We're going to try to date. Let me just clarify something. When I said there was a dip, there, the, this split is between the northern and southern Leposomus skin group. Right, that's the, the one I'm... You know. Yeah, but this group is all in the central Atlantic forest. Yeah. It's not central but and when you showed the map, it looked like the clade, the, 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 those correspond to a northern and, and more northern and, you know, and less northern clade. They were both kind of north. But. <laughs> that's right. That's precise. But, yes, exactly. Here. So yeah. they're, they're mm -hmm. both here. And the, here is the divide, the geographic divide. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's the age of that split? And Don't know yet. What's Sorry. the mitochondrial divergence, for example? The, oh, it's 10%. So it's old. It's it's very old. It's very old. Yes, if you yeah if you think it's allopatric, if you think a molecular clock, it's what one percent half to one percent million year. It's very very old. It's Much it's older than certainly older than the, the twenty one k. Yes. Yeah. It's it's older than any of the ages yeah. you were you were showing there. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so do, do you see that same division in other taxa? Yes, yeah. I do. Okay. But I also think that those. Uh, later quaternary climatic oscillations might be important in uh, maintaining the dig phylogeographic structure that was established way back. Okay, so, but they're not explaining that, that division. No, 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 they're not because yeah. those splits are much, much older than yeah. that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I'm thinking of your co-authors are here today, Roberta, but I wonder if you care to explain your inventions talk about Lionel Richie. <laughs> oh no no! I want to answer this question. <laughs> yeah, okay. I just I wonder if you care to comment on that. That was one of the highlights of your 
Oh yeah, so we realized that my haircut is really similar to all Lana Richard video clips. <laughs> you know what? Let's, let's just advertise. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, I'm, I'm roasting a little bit. Uh, uh, Lionel Richard posted in various places in the box, Have you so seen the videos? That's fine. That's yeah. why we like it. <laughs> That's right. There's, there was no music to the, your presentation. Oh, we yeah. had, you have high, you know, bars um, to Where's the Craig picture? After the Tom Devitt, <laughs> you know, Barry White. <laughs> Talk. <laughs> Very white. Well. Yeah. Well, how come there wasn't well, any? Rich you know, if you come to the to 3172, we do have musical moments in the office. Musical moments. Every day we watch a video clip and look. Look is my witness here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do. We have great musical and dancing moments in 3172. Uh, 3172. Yeah. So, so yeah, I obviously put them to the side. <laughs> <laughs> wrapping up. Are, are there other questions for Roberta? I'm here next door for three more weeks. So. I, I meant to say at the beginning I, I was going to invite uh, uh, anybody to introduce new people and I was going to invite introduce some of the new people from my lab but some have already left so I, my apologies we'll do that next week I, I want to make sure anybody who's new meets everybody else so uh, sorry Taichi and others we'll, we'll get to you next week <laughs> thank you Roberta. Thank you.